It might have taken me two years, but we are finally going to do the AMA. I pretty much, I don't have a fancy setup or anything. I just downloaded the questions onto my phone and I'm just going to be reading them off. Literally, this is the first time I'm looking at the questions. So you guys could get the most genuine response from me. So my first time off script. So let's see how it goes. So Fenris1349 asks, were you assaulted by a pack of ravenous tomes that inspired the name of your channel? So no, nothing so spectacular. I wish it was something cooler. Um, the name of my channel actually comes from my grandmother's maiden name. It was Savage. So believe it or not, her last name was literally Savage. Um, she passed away um, right around the time I was making the channel. Um, so I thought to name the channel after her. And the books part comes from the fact that I like to write books. So Savage Books is my grandma's last name. Um, with the books attached onto it. Michael Williams asks, what show or movie is your go-to recommendation for someone who hasn't seen it? Um, so this is, honestly for me, it's Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I think it's the perfect introduction to anime. It's just Western enough for people who have never seen anime to get a good foothold, um, but it's also just anime enough so you do get a good sense of what anime is. It's just long enough so that you feel like you're always getting something out of it and it's just a top three anime for me all time and i think it's accessible to anyone so full metal alchemist brotherhood is my answer to what do i recommend to people if they have not seen it atomi asks what is your favorite episode of game of thrones and why um so i'm not specifically sure what episode it is i believe it's season six episode 10 but it's whatever the episode is where cersei bombs the sept um, and the reason I was so hyped for it is because the music leaked for it beforehand, The Light of the Seven is the name of the song, and I had stayed on the Game of Thrones subreddit literally probably like every day of the entirety of that show's run. And people had already dissected exactly what was going to be happening while that music was playing, and it was one-to-one -one perfect predictions. And everything that went on, like the lack of dialogue, um, just the, the visuals, the music, um, it was perfect. And the rest of the episode is also really cool too. Um, so whatever that is, maybe I think it's called the winds of winter, but it's the episode where Cersei bombs the sept. Um, that's far and away, I think maybe not far and away, but that's my favorite episode of game of Thrones. Rachel Ellis asks, what type of work slash writing do you have the most fun doing? Um, so if we're going to do work and writing, um, the most fun work I have is actually YouTube. I literally love YouTube. Uh, making videos and doing the research for them. That's that's the most fun I think I've ever had working, doing anything. Um, and my favorite writing is really weird, out there kind of fiction pulled off in a way um, that can draw people in in a really simple form. Um, so again, just to reference Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, the end of that story is literally about like a god trying to eat the sun, but it's done in such a way that it seems completely reasonable for that story. Um, so, so any kind of narrative or story based around um, taking something really strange and then easing someone into it so it seems just completely acceptable, um, that's, that's my favorite kind of writing. Cat the Hufflepuff asks, what's the best advice you could give someone for trying to avoid copyright issues when making a video on movies, TV, or music? So excellent question. Um, I've had literally almost everything I've done copyright striked. Um, so the best thing that I could actually tell you is what I have been told from a great YouTuber, um, Henry, who runs, uh, the closer look. Um, he actually told me to keep all of my clips around or under 12 seconds. Um, I've learned that if my clips for anything that I'm using is 12 seconds or under, I'm crystal clear for copyright stuff. I've actually not had any problems with my most recent videos because I've been doing that. So that's why if you've noticed, the clips for those videos are a bit closer together um, and shorter than in my previous videos, but it helps not getting copyright striked. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeet or be Yeetin, which is a fantastic username, asks, what is your favorite and least favorite aspect of editing? This could refer to editing your own work or that of others. Same question for writing as well. Um, so I'll do editing my own work. Um, I, I just hate having to go back over once the entire book is finished. If I'm working on a piece of fiction and having to just comb through to find all like the connectivity issues or the consistency issues or like the grammar, I hate grammar um, and spelling and line editing. I have a real problem with just like having a bunch of typos 
um, that appear. I'm fine with big picture editing. Obviously, it's my job and I love to do it. Um, but that's the worst part of editing. Um, as far as editing my own work, what I enjoy about it, I really like getting into a piece of fiction and writing it and then realizing in the moment that I have figured out a way to connect the pieces that I didn't think would go together to make things even better. So kind of editing while writing the story, um, I think is really cool. Um, and the same thing goes for when I work with clients, editing their stories to make things that didn't necessarily seem to work in the narrative, maybe in the outline, and then finding a connective piece to have everything like kind of smashed together in an elegant way, if that makes any sense. Um, so those are, those are my favorite and least favorite parts of editing. Kate asks, how are you? I'm good, Kate. Mauricio Mendez asks, how do you usually choose topics for your videos? Uh, so this is a really good question and it's becoming harder and harder to choose topics for my videos, mainly because um, I never want to kind of repeat something. And every time I choose a topic for a video, I'm doing it because I think it's something that people can learn from. So I never just want to comment on a, on a, a TV show or like a movie um, or even a piece of any type of fiction. Um, I want to present something in a way that people can learn from it. So I'm always looking for fiction that has teachable moments and not every fiction has teachable moments, even if it's really popular. Almost all of my videos um, have some piece of writing contained within them that I feel people would actually learn from. And if I've already done that uh, aspect of writing in a video, I'm probably not going to do a video on that kind of subject again, even if the source material is really popular. Manash Joshi, and excuse me please if I butcher any of these names, I have no experience with like half of these, so I'm gonna try my best. Manash Joshi asks, how do you increase your vocabulary? So this is gonna be like the worst answer probably that I could give, but literally most of what I learned um, as far as vocabulary came from playing like text heavy video games. Um, so like Yu-Gi-Oh, um, Pokemon, RPGs. And the reason why is because I'm a visual learner. So being able to see the text for what was happening in correlation with like moves or types or magic um, helped me to get a wide array of vocabulary that I think carried on throughout the rest of my life. Um, but it, it, it really comes down to, if you wanna be really simple about it, um, reading just a lot and then being investigative when you don't know what a word means, just going out of your way to look it up. Um, but for me, it was always video games, text heavy video games. And more one, two, three, go asks, what's your best advice for writers? Um, so this may seem weird, but my advice is write, wait, read, write. So I, I always advise people to write down what they want to write. So, so start your fiction and then you want to wait at least three weeks before you even touch that fiction again, whether if it's a chapter or if it's the completed book, um, then you want to read. While you're waiting, read other people's stuff, read accomplished writer stuff. And then you're gonna wanna go back and read your own stuff. And what happens is that time you spend away from your own fiction, it kind of pulls you away. So you're, you're not only now seeing the trees, you're seeing the forest and the trees. And you go, crap, this is really bad, or this is really good. Um, because when you're in the actual weeds of writing in the first place, and when you first start, you're not able to see your mistakes clearly. But if you wait and then read other people's successful writing and then go back in, you'll be able to learn and apply all those new things that you've seen to your own work. So that's my best advice for writers. Day One asks, are we living in the movie Idiocracy? No, we're living in Pandemic. Dennis S. asks, how has the current situation affected your content creation and video reception? Um, great question. So at first I was really worried that I would have problems on YouTube. The CPM, which is basically the amount of money that I get paid per thousand views, um, was really low at the beginning of the year because advertisers, I feel like didn't have a lot of money to advertise because people just weren't buying things as they used to. And I was also getting less views on YouTube than I was used to getting. Um, but recently I've had kind of a surge in views at the time of filming this, I'm at around 125,000 subscribers on the main channel. And just thinking back, I think at the beginning of the year, I was at 90,000. So that's like what a 30% growth, um, just in like the last six months. Um, so if anything, it's been really good. I've had a really good run of videos, Reddit. I think I've done popular videos on popular topics. Um, but the current situation surprisingly has been really good for me. Um, and I'm just happy I'm kind of in an industry that's insulated from all the, the really horrific offense that are happening kind of right now. 
Uncomfortable Cat asks, do you mind making a video on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Um, funny enough, since I've been watching so much Sunny when I work out, I've kind of been more and more tempted to actually sit down and like write a video about the writing that goes into making Always Sunny so good. Um, so you actually might see an Always Sunny in Philadelphia video from me very soon. Sky P asks, what shows would you like to talk about in the future? Um, so I would love to do more anime videos, surprisingly. Um, I, it's just very difficult because a lot of the times those get copyrighted very easily. Like I was just able to put Death Note back up and as far as I know, it's still up, but we'll see in another few days. Uh, there's a show called uh, Kakeguri, which to me has the best episode one of almost anything I've ever seen. Um, and I would love to talk about that. Um, I want to do an Ozark video. I'd love to talk about Adventure Time. Um, you know, there's just a bunch of stuff. There's literally too much stuff for me to go through. Um, but those are just some examples of things that I would like to talk about. RPG Time asks, have you written any books, screenplays, etc. of your own? So yes, I've written five books and am technically writing my sixth and seventh right now. Um, I say technically because both of them are kind of in the works. So I have one book available through Amazon, um, and that is the Heart of Woe book that I've kind of talked about in the past. The, the first book that I've written is roughly, I believe, right now, like 430 pages. My second book was 100 pages, third book was 100 pages, fourth book was 300 pages, fifth book was 150 pages, um, and then the sixth book is looking to be around 200 pages and then the seventh book is looking to be eh, that'll probably be like three to four hundred pages um when i finish them so yes i have written multiple books no screenplays though so aradel asks how can you be sure that a character is the right person to be telling the story that's a fantastic question and i think it's a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention um and i'm going to try to keep this as short as possible because it's a very complex answer so basically the character that you want to be telling the story and to be at the center of the story needs to be the character that allows the reader or the audience to gain the most amount of information that's going to make the story make sense. Um, and to say that in a kind of a simpler way, if there are certain things that are happening, certain events in the narrative that occur outside of a character's perspective, um, maybe they aren't the best person to be telling the story from because the audience won't be able to get plot sensitive information because if the character doesn't know it, maybe the audience can't find it. Um, kind of another way to look at this from a different angle is, is the character embodying the themes and message of what I want to tell in the story? So if I'm telling a story about rags to riches, is this character that the story is focused on are they going from rags to riches or riches to rags or is is their journey effective in trying to convey the message i want and if you see that they don't necessarily have the traits or go down the path that you're envisioning for the story maybe they're not the best character for it um, i could literally talk at length about this question and maybe i will in a video um, but those are kind of like my best answers for now Sebastian Yu asks, in the early stages of writing, when you're dealing with self-doubt and second-guessing your ideas, how do you overcome that? Um, also a really good question. So I think the best thing you can do for self-doubt, if you're having trouble with your confidence in writing, I would say really focus on writing what you want to write. Write for yourself, write for a party of one. Because if you get to the point where, you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm bad, no one's going to like to read this you should step back and say, you know what? Okay, let me write how I want to enjoy. Let me write things that I'm going to want to look at. And then let me worry about writing for other people. You know, and even if you think your stuff is bad, it's all about improving for you. Because at the end of the day, writing really does need to be something that you enjoy. Because if you hate writing, I mean, you can still be successful at it, but the best writing comes from enjoyment. Um, so if you have self-doubt, remove all of the obstacles of things that are kind of putting pressure on you and just write to have fun and just write for yourself. And I think improvements will come when you see that you actually enjoy the craft and, and looking for things to get better at. Brenton McCullough asks, what is the quickest way to kill a story and the most core thing that puts it back on the right path? So the quickest way to kill a story, in my opinion, is to take tension and ambiguity out of where the story is going. Um, and I don't mean allowing the audience to know where the story concludes, because there's tons of stories that tell you the conclusion at the beginning. But what I'm talking about is making stories predictable. If a story is predictable, um, there's 
all all of the 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 momentum the the drive for that story is gone um and people don't want to watch something that they feel they know the ending to and to get it back on track is to subvert expectations and i know that's kind of like a demonized uh phrase now because of what game of thrones did um but if you have a story where you make people believe that they know what's going to happen and then obviously you do something different that's an excellent way to, to get the story back on track but for me personally i believe just as an editor and a consumer that if you make a story predictable no matter how cool it is it kind of loses a lot of its luster ca shea asks how many times do you suggest reviewing or going over a manuscript before submitting it um an infinite amount of times i know that's not a real answer but there there kind of is no number um, every manuscript or every script or every piece of fiction or every piece of art, um, it takes sometimes a dozen, two dozen, a hundred different, you know, overviews by the creator before it's ready to be put out. I know that I have a rule that I have to read through my book three times completely um, before I pretty much let any professional see it. Um, because I need to make sure that the first time, the second time, and the third time, I'm comfortable with where it is. Um, so you may need to review your work once if you feel it's comfortable then. And obviously you're going to find out if that process is right for you. Because if you keep getting your work sent back to you saying, hey, this isn't good enough, well, maybe you need to review it more than once. Um, but, but sitting on something, there's, there's never a problem with, you know, reviewing something as many times as you need, but it's also about having confidence and being like, you know what, I'm comfortable where the story is. The changes I make might be so minute that it really wouldn't matter. Um, let me start, let me start giving this to people. Goldberg asks, what is your favorite arc in Naruto? Um, so that's really hard because I'm gonna count Shippuden inside this. I really, really like the Great Ninja War. Um, I'm a sucker for bringing characters back to life to make them face off against other characters who they are emotionally invested in. And that's like the entirety of the Ninja War at the end of Shippuden. Um, but core Naruto, where Orochimaru is like facing the third Hokage, um, or where Gara has his mental breakdown, or even just the tuning exams, um, or the sound five, that's, that's, that's all really good. So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tie between those two. The Pokestop asks, how important are character names actually? Do they matter? So aside from a narrative that's literally based in a character name, like how a plot would be, like if there's plot sensitive information and the conclusion is based on a character name, character names aren't that important. Um, so don't really trip on that. But character names can be either positives or negatives for a narrative. So the typical fantasy trope is to have a character name with 18 letters and like apostrophes and you know, those orcish names that you see like all over the place or like name a character like Malgor, like Bad Big or something, you know. Um, and those, if they're cliche, they can be a detriment. Um, but if you're naming a character in a way that has maybe a poetic meaning or a subtle meaning or a meaning that comes into play for the story, then that could be a positive. Um, but most of the time, unless a character name is completely distracting or if it's super similar to another character's name, um, names don't really matter that much. It really comes down to who the character is um, and the writing behind them. Cyberfire117 asks, what is your favorite color? Green, it always has been, and it always will be. Faez Debestani asks, what is the biggest reason you became an editor? Um, because I really like it, and I felt that I kind of had a talent for it, and I had no problem doing it for hours at a time. I was doing it for free anyway before I had started doing this professionally. Um, and I just felt that some stories were not as good as they could be and I had ideas on how they could be better and people agreed with those ideas um, and I said hey I just want to do this you know for eight hours a day seven days a week and it's kind of what I'm doing this is a great question bombastic tambourine asks what series slash single story any type of media that is objectively bad but you enjoy and also the opposite what is a series slash single story that is objectively good, but you don't enjoy? Um, so let's start off with single story that is objectively bad, but you enjoy. I've talked about this before. I love Aquaman. Aquaman is a dumpster fire. Like I recognize actively that it's horrible, but I really like it. Um, I think it appeals to the baser, explodey lizard brain side of my head. 
And I just, I've seen that movie three or four times. I just can't get enough of it. Um, so Aquaman is my most immediate answer to that. I'm sure there are other movies that are bad that I enjoy. And I'm not afraid to admit it. As for the opposite, funny enough, while I do think the movie is good, I actually didn't take that much away from Parasite. Um, I recognize that it's really well made. And objectively, it's a very expertly crafted film. I personally just didn't enjoy the time that much. On a side note, I personally don't enjoy Ant-Man that much either, which is crazy because George R. R. Martin, who's kind of like my writing idol, has said that Ant-Man is his favorite Marvel movie, and I just, I've never enjoyed Ant-Man. I don't know what it is about it. Um, I recognize it's probably an objectively well-made movie. Don't enjoy it. Adriel Agoler asks, who is your all-time favorite hero and villain from a book or series, any genre? Um, very difficult. I don't think I even have an answer for this. My favorite, one of my favorite characters ever is Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. Um, I love the idea of an omnipresent, near omniscient God character that is basically also just human. Um, I just have a list, you know, Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada, a Gus Fring from Breaking Bad, um, Ulkiora Schiffer from Bleach. Um, gosh, there are literally, there's just too many to, to name um they, but they come in all shapes and sizes as far as a hero because i guess that was technically a list of villains um as far as heroes i can't even think of one off the top of my head um my favorite hero yeah i have no idea absolutely no idea go figure tyler carter asks have you ever considered watching adventure time it's got incredible world building in my opinion, and if you like animation, it's a good thing to watch. So yes, I have watched Adventure Time. Adventure Time was my favorite cartoon show when I was in high school, surprisingly. I stopped watching it when I got to college, um, but I love Adventure Time, uh, and I, I really wish I could get back into it again. Maybe I will. Own Swan asks, what is your favorite Netflix original show and movie? Um, I don't think I have a favorite Netflix original movie. Maybe it's... Um, whatever that one was with Will Smith and the Orc. I'm I'm not saying it's a bad movie or it's forgettable. I literally just am blinking on it right now. Um, as far as my favorite Netflix original show, um, I think it's You. Um, I absolutely adore You. I put it in my top three TV shows of all time. Um, I've been wanting to do a video on it. I might do a video on it in the future, um, but I highly recommend You. Um, I, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. Favender asks, what magic do you think separates Avatar The Last Airbender from The Legend of Korra? All right, here we go. <laughs> uh, no, this will be short. Um, I think one of the things that really separates Korra from Avatar The Last Airbender and what keeps Korra from truly being really great is that Korra, at its conception, was not made to be the show that it turned out to be. Korra, from what I know, was just supposed to be a miniseries, like one season, which is why Korra, I think, mastered all the elements at the end of season one, um, or at least came close to it. And they were like, hey, this could make money. Let's make more. But the original Avatar was always written in such a way that it was supposed to be multiple seasons told over multiple books. And even though there's a host of other problems that go into why Korra on some levels works and on a lot of levels doesn't. I think one of the core reasons is that the show itself became bigger than it was intended and you could plainly see that from uh, season to season from Korra. And this will be the last question, I guess. Flower001186 asks, what's the most random cool fact you could bring up in a conversation? Um, most random cool fact, I guess there's two if we're talking about me. Um, I, my arms are six foot 10 inches long. Um, so I'm six foot four. So my arm span is six inches longer than my height. And maybe I can't do it now because I have old man knees, but back when I was like the most physically fit I ever was, um, I had like a, like over a 40 inch vertical. So I could jump over like three feet, maybe like three and a half feet. Um, so I was like dunking a basketball when I was in like ninth grade. Um, and, you know, I was touching basically like the top of the white box on, on like a backboard, um, or like 
11 foot ceilings and stuff like that. Um, so that's, those are the two coolest things about me. So with that though, that's the end of the AMA. This was actually really fun. Um, I'll probably do more in the future. I only got through, you know, 30 questions out of the 150 or so that were submitted. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned a little bit about me. Um, if you want to support the channel, um, I'll put a link for Patreon down in the description. Um, I hope to post a video again soon. Thank you guys for watching and I'll talk to you all again very soon.